Welcome to Lesson 5D, Head Form of the Energy Equation. In this lesson, we'll manipulate the control volume energy equation into head form. We'll discuss the efficiencies of pumps and turbines, how to put them into this equation. We'll also discuss irreversible losses, and we'll do some example problems. Let's start with the steady state, steady flow, conservation of energy equation for a fixed control volume. Notice that we're including our alphas, the kinetic energy correction factors. We've already assumed steady flow. Now let's also assume we have only one inlet. That allows us to get rid of this sigma, and one outlet will get rid of this sigma. We'll always call the inlet 1 and the outlet 2. So here's a typical setup. We have a flow coming in, a flow coming out, and going through some kind of turbine machine, which can be a pump or a turbine. We have some net heat transfer coming in, and we have some shaft work. We pick a wise control volume that cuts through the outlet, cuts through the inlet, and cuts through the shaft. We don't have to follow exactly along the pipes, but can put our control volume anywhere outside here. So with these assumptions and approximations, equation 1 becomes this equation, which is basically the same thing except without the sigmas. Now let's split h back into u plus p over rho in both places where h occurs, so we get this second equation. To get it into head form, we divide by m dot g. We also rearrange, noting that m dot is equal to m dot 1 and m dot 2, since there's only one inlet and outlet. You can see from these z terms that the dimensions of every term in this equation or that of length, or head. So this is now a head form of the equation. But let's do some further manipulation. We define this grouping of terms as HL, the irreversible head loss. And then the final form of this equation becomes what we'll call the head form of the energy equation, which I call equation 2. But let's do some further analysis and manipulation of this equation. I want to talk briefly about this head loss term. HL is a length, or a head. If there were no irreversibilities, like friction or heat transfer through finite temperature differences, etc., then the change in internal energy of the fluid would exactly equal the rate of heat transfer into the fluid divided by mass flow rate. Dividing both terms by G, we can see immediately that that means that HL equals zero. In other words, no irreversible head losses. Physically, the internal energy rise in the fluid is due only to heat transfer. But in the real world, there are always irreversible losses. Thus, the actual rise in internal energy is greater than the rise due to heat transfer into the fluid. Again, from this equation, that means HL is greater than zero. Since we live in the real world, HL is always greater than zero. There are always irreversible losses. If there weren't, you'd be violating the second law of thermodynamics, which you never want to do, by the way. These irreversible losses are accounted for in this HL term in equation two. Now let's talk about this shaft power. We're going to split it into pumps and turbines. Let's let W dot shaft net in equal a summation of all the pumps in our control volume minus a summation of all the turbines in our control volume. In most of our problems, we only have one pump or one turbine, and usually only one or the other. So we don't need the sigmas. Although if you have pumps or turbines in series, you can add the sigmas back in. By convention, we separate pump and turbine irreversible losses from the other irreversible losses in the HL term. In other words, we treat pump and turbine losses separately. Here's how we'll do that. We'll define H pump U as the useful head supplied by the pump. And we'll define a pump efficiency, eta pump. So H pump U is eta pump, the shaft power of the pump, W dot pump divided by M dot G. Note that there's an efficiency because there are irreversibilities in a pump. But we note that HL does not include irreversible losses in the pump. We're treating those separately by defining an efficiency of the pump. Eta pump is the pump efficiency, which we define as the useful power supplied to the fluid divided by the shaft power supplied to the control volume. In turbo machinery parlance, they call the numerator water horsepower and the denominator brake horsepower. This terminology is used even if the fluid is not water, but I prefer to call it useful power, hence the subscript U. Like any efficiency, eta pump has to be less than one. Now let's talk about a turbine. It's similar but opposite. Let eta turbine be the turbine efficiency. It'll be the shaft power extracted from the control volume over the power extracted from the fluid. We see that it's the opposite, in other words, the reciprocal of pump efficiency. You have to supply more shaft power to get some useful power. Similarly for a turbine, you have to extract more power from the fluid 
to get the required extracted power through the shaft. Again, in turbo machinery parlance, eta turbine is equal to brake horsepower over water horsepower. Again, due to the second law, it always has to be less than one. Some more notation, just as we defined H pump U, we now define H turbine E, where the E stands for the extracted head removed or extracted from the fluid by the turbine. So H turbine E is 1 over eta turbine, the turbine efficiency, times the shaft power of the turbine over m dot g. Compared to our pump, notice that eta pump is in the numerator here, but eta turbine is in the denominator here. We do that so that eta can be some number between 0 and 1. I emphasize again that HL represents the irreversible head losses due to all irreversibilities except those associated with pumps and turbines, since we treat these losses separately by using pump and turbine efficiencies. Putting all this together, we get the final form of the head form of the energy equation in its most useful form, which I'll call equation 3. I'll put lots of stars around this equation. This is our workhorse equation for most of our analyses that we'll do from now on. I've also rearranged so that we have the inlet on the left and the pumps, and then the outlet and the turbines on the right, as well as the irreversible head loss. If you only have one pump and one turbine, you get this form, which is actually the one we'll most often use. Now we're ready for some example problems. There are several examples in the textbook that you should study. I'll do two examples here and many more in later lessons. For our first example, let's look at a firefighting water pump. We have a self-priming pump, which means you can stick it in the water and it'll draw water in without having to prime the pump. We draw water from this lake and shoot it out through the nozzle. Of course, there's a pump with some input shaft power. There's also an elevation increase. We give the pipe diameters, the average velocity at the outlet, and the pump efficiency, which is 80%. We also give these vertical elevation changes, delta Z2 and delta Z1. At this point, I'm going to give you the irreversible head losses. These losses are due to friction in these pipes, and there are additional losses through elbows and nozzles, which we'll learn how to estimate in Chapter 8 in the Changal Symbol of Fluids book. And you'll be able to calculate these irreversible head losses on your own. For now, I'll give them as 4.50 meters of equivalent water column height. For this problem, we're asked to calculate the volume flow rate of the water in meter cube per hour and gallons per minute. Since this is all review, I type this up. Volume flow rate is just V2 average times A2 and get this volume flow rate. Now we want to calculate the power delivered by the pump to the water, in other words, the water horsepower in units of kilowatts, and the required shaft power to the pump, in other words, the brake horsepower, again, in units of kilowatts. The first thing in any of these analyses is to pick a control volume, and then we can apply this head form of the energy equation. So let's go back to the diagram and pick a wise control volume. We know that we have to pass our control volume through the outlet, which is 2, and then we can go around all this other stuff, around the entire piping system and the pump. We know we want to cut through the shaft, but how do we handle the inlet? Most of you would be tempted to put the inlet at the actual pipe inlet and call that 1. That's not wrong, it's just not the wisest choice of control volume. Why? Because then we'd need to calculate the pressure and the speed and the kinetic energy correction factor at this inlet. So instead, I'm going to send my control volume right below the water surface and come around as deep as I want and then enclose the entire lake and therefore have a complete control volume. This is a wise choice of control volume. If we call one this surface, we know the pressure, P1 equal P atmosphere, and we know the speed at 1, which is approximately 0. If you think about it, this lake will be draining as we pump this water out, but the speed V1 will be negligible if it's a large lake. So we'll just set V1 to be 0. As a general hint in these kinds of problems, anytime you have a reservoir or a lake at either your inlet or at your outlet, which we don't have in this case, it's always wise to take your control surface along the actual surface of the water, technically a tiny bit below it, where the flow coming in has the right mass flow rate but is at zero velocity, and the pressure is atmospheric. So now let's go back to our energy equation in head form using this control volume that we defined. Here's another useful bit of information. 
at the exit plane of an incompressible or even nearly incompressible jet shooting into the air p equal p atmosphere at that exit plane you'll find this to be very valuable information for many problems that we do so looking again at our control volume we know that p1 equal p atmosphere and now we know that p2 is also equal to p atmosphere since it is a jet exiting into air and water is nearly incompressible as discussed previously this atmospheric pressure is slightly lower than this atmospheric pressure but those effects are totally negligible since water has such a higher density than air so we'll ignore that coming back to our equation the two pressure terms cancel since they're both equal to atmospheric pressure we've already said that v1 is approximately zero so that term goes away we have no turbine in this problem and so we're left with these terms we solve for h pump u the useful head delivered by the pump to the fluid we get h pump u equal alpha 2 v2 squared over 2g plus z2 minus z1 which we call delta z2 in the figure plus those pesty irreversible losses which are always there looking at this equation as a side note the pump does three things the first term i'll call a it increases the kinetic energy of the water term b increases the potential energy of the water and term c overcomes irreversible losses hopefully that helps you understand what the pump is doing the pump has to deliver useful power to the fluid to account for all three of these terms in terms of water horsepower we simply multiply h pump u by m dot g and recognize that m dot is rho v dot since we were given a volume flow rate in this problem so the water horsepower is rho v dot g times these three terms terms which is h pump u so this is our answer to part b in variable form i can't emphasize enough how important it is to do all your work in variables before plugging in any numbers as far as you can this will save you a lot of headaches in life now we plug in the numbers the density of water at 20 degrees c the volume flow rate we previously calculated g times alpha 2 which i'll assume is 1.05 this is definitely a turbulent flow v2 squared over 2g plus delta z2 plus hl which was given in this problem now some unity conversion factors newton is a kilogram meter per second squared a watt is a newton meter per second and a kilowatt is a thousand watts you can show on your own that all the units cancel out except kilowatts which is what we want my calculator gives me 77.756 kilowatts and my final answer to three digits is 77.8 kilowatt. Finally, part C is to calculate the brake horsepower, which we abbreviate BHP, which by definition of the efficiency is the water horsepower divided by eta pump. So we use our water horsepower and the given efficiency, and we get 97.2 kilowatts as our brake horsepower. Notice that BHP, which is the actual shaft power supplied to the pump, is greater than the power supplied to the water, and that's due to pump inefficiencies. I'll do another example. This one has water draining from a tank. Water drains by gravity from a tank that's exposed to atmospheric pressure. We have a vertical elevation change delta Z, a valve, and a long pipe. Again, we give the irreversible head losses but later on you'll be able to calculate this yourself we want to calculate the average speed at the outlet again we use the head form of the conservation of energy equation but the first step is to choose a wise control volume instead of putting the inlet one at this pipe inlet let's put it up here for the same reasons as the previous problem namely p1 is approximately p atmosphere and v1 is approximately zero also similar to the previous problem p2 is p atmosphere so a wise control volume cuts through the surface of the tank through the exit or outlet around the valve and then closing again at the surface now let's look at our equation there's no pump, there's no turbine. These two terms cancel since P1 and P2 are both atmospheric pressure. And as I said, V1 is approximately zero by Y's choice of control volume. You're welcome to put your inlet here if you want. Then you'd have to analyze what the pressure is here. Since this is moving flow, it will not just be the hydrostatic pressure. And from what you've learned so far in this course, you're not even able to do that. You'd also have to calculate a kinetic energy correction factor. We were asked to find V2 so we solve this equation for v2 
V2 is the quantity, 2g over alpha 2, delta z minus hl, the whole quantity raised to the 1 half power. But what is alpha 2? Let's assume fully developed laminar pipe flow at 2. This is a good approximation since this is such a long pipe, so the flow gets fully developed. Whether it's laminar or turbulent, we'll be able to tell later on in the course by calculating the Reynolds number. But for now, let's just assume it's laminar pipe flow. So we set alpha 2 equal to 2. Quick comment here, we don't even need alpha 1 because this term has gone away. But this would be a situation where the inlet speed is nearly uniform across here. So alpha 1 would be 1 or very close to 1, but we don't even need it. By the way, this is our answer in variable form. We plug in the numbers using alpha 2 equal 2, 2g over 2.0, 0 0.5 meters minus 0 0.4 meters, the whole thing to the 1 half power, which gives us 0 0.990 meters per second. So that's our final answer. One quick comment. We're using a steady form of this energy equation. Some of you may say, well, this is not a steady problem because this tank is draining with time. So delta Z is changing. That's true, but this is happening very slowly if this is a large tank. In engineering, we call that quasi-steady. This equation can still be used at any instant in time. If you wait a long time and the tank is, say, half the height, you can redo the analysis with that different water height in a quasi-steady fashion. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.